back, grade 12, with Unit 1 Word Star, The Fantastic Plastic Brain. Today's focus is on speaking. We are going to do the focus on speaking. If you open your books and turn to page 14. Okay. First thing we're going to do is we're going to focus on the vocabulary today. Yeah, as we always do, we always start with the vocabulary, right? Okay, let's read this little part of review. Taxi drivers in London are known as the Olympic athletes of memory, according to Joshua Four, author of the best-selling book Moonwalking with Einstein, The Art and Science of Remembering Everything. Dr. Janet Alcalde, professor of neuroscience, recently spoke about the book to an audience at a community event for senior citizens. Alcalde discussed a well-known study details in Forrest's book. Okay, what we're going to do right now, you're going to read and listen uh, to a transcript of the discussion. And I want you to notice the bold-faced words. So we already know that the bold-faced words are, um, is, uh, uh, are the words, the vocabulary words for this unit. Okay, let's go. Tell us, do London taxi drivers really grow bigger brains simply by navigating their routes? It's tough for me to buy into the idea that we can rewire our brains just by driving a taxi. Yes, I know. There are a lot of skeptics out there who don't buy into this conclusion. But listen, meticulous research was conducted by a British neuroscientist named Ellen McGuire, who wanted to find out what effect all the driving around the spaghetti-like, higgledy-piggledy London streets might have on the cabbie's brains. A few years later, this initial study was authenticated, and it rendered the same conclusion. The results are simply astounding. Professor Alcalde, I'm not sure I understand. Are you saying that the driver's brains were affected by the driving itself? Not exactly. Let me back up a bit. In order to be certified as a cab driver in London, you have to go through a really challenging process, which involves memorizing the locations and traffic patterns of all 25,000 maze-like streets, 20,000 landmarks, and 320 routes connecting all of it. An incredibly confusing landscape. Then, the cabbies have to take a rigorous test called the knowledge, in which they have to produce by heart all of this information. The ones that pass the test are not necessarily the best and the brightest, or the cabbies displaying creativity or ingenuity or anything like that. Rather, success depends on hours and hours of practice and the competency to mentally register and have memorized all the names and landmarks. Okay, well, so why are these cabbies called the Olympic athletes of memory? Well, the neuroscientist McGuire examined the cabbies' brains and found that the right posterior hippocampus, the part of the brain responsible for spatial navigation, was 7% larger than normal. Now, don't fool yourself into thinking that that percentage is not a big deal. Trust me. It is small, but very significant. So, she concluded that the act of finding your way around London physically altered the structure of the brain. In addition, the effects grew incrementally each year the cabbies weaved their way through those London streets. Okay, you see a beautiful picture of the brain here right now. Now, this is not just a picture, this we will call a diagram. Because a diagram is uh, one visual that has an explanation of every component within that visual. So this would be a diagram, a diagram of the brain. Okay. Now we continue, focus on the bold faced words, the vocabulary, right? Words and phrases. Remember a phrase, right? When it is one word, it's worth. When it is two words or three, 
and it is not a sentence, meaning it has no subject and a verb, means it's a phrase, okay? Now, what we're going to do uh, is you're going to uh, guess the meaning from the context of the transcript, which one, uh, which one is it, A, B, or C. So I'd like you to cross out the word in each group below. It does not have a meaning similar to the word as it is used in the conversation. Oh, wait. Okay, one more time. You cross out the word in each group below from A, B, and C. Yeah, that does not have a meaning similar to the words as it is used in the conversation. So that had a different meaning. So they were talking, number one, about uh, using the phrase buy into. <clears throat> to buy into uh, means to believe, means to accept. And uh, in this case, what they didn't mean and they didn't mention was create. They did not use buy into. Uh, to implicate the meaning create. So you would have to cross out C, create, as that is one of the meanings of the phrase buy into that was not used in the audio. Okay, you can pause your video and answer number 2 until 16. Go ahead. Okay, great. Well done. Now we come to the point to um, expand. Um, as we already did the vocabulary just now, and knowing how the words have multiple meanings, one word can have multiple meanings, that's why it's a word family, right? Uh, you having to find the words, the meaning of the words that it wasn't used in that way. We continue with um, the expansion, and we're going to read the following statements and uh, then read about confusing parts of words. Notice the boldface words. Now, if we're talking about confusing, um, confusing pairs of words, uh, those are words that are very similar, okay? They're similar in their pronunciation. They might be similar in their writing. If it's similar in the pronunciation, that would be a homophone. Remember that? Those are words that sound the same but have definitely a different meaning and most likely also are written differently. If we're talking about uh, homographs, we're talking about words that are written exactly the same way but have a different meaning and mostly have the same pronunciation, sometimes different. Now, so we're looking at that, the confusing pairs of words that might sound the same, so homophones, okay? Let's look at the first sentence. The stroke caused a loss of brain cells, which in turn affected her ability to move her legs. So we have the word affected. The second sentence, after the stroke, the doctors encouraged her to do crossword puzzles, saying that the brain gymnastics could effect a change in brain functioning. Three. After eight weeks of the brain gymnastics, she and her doctors perceived the positive effect of the rigorous mental exercise. So here we see two words, effect and effect. You do kind of hear a difference, but it is very similar. Yeah? Most of the times when we use this word, uh, people would not really hear the difference so well in its pronunciation. So we really know which one we're referring to by paying attention to the context. So we say effect and effect are words that are often confused. Okay, so effect as a verb means to influence. I can affect you. I can influence you. Effect as a verb means to bring about, to change, you know, movement. It is nearly always followed by the word change. That's why effect often has the word change going with it. Such as effect to change. Effect is more commonly used also as a noun, meaning a result. So effect can also be the result of something. So they have uh, different meanings, though the sound of both words are very similar. And therefore confusing, so often use confusing words. 
Um, so what you're going to do, you're going to listen and repeat each set of confusing pairs just to figure out there, these are some common words that are mistaken and uh, I'd like you to listen to it and maybe you can uh, pronounce them by yourself at home uh, one by one uh, to get the pronunciation going. Let's go. One. Accept. Accept. Two. Access. Access. Three. Advise. Advice. Four. Assure. Ensure. Five. Effect. 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 Six. Counsel. Counsel. Seven. Disinterested. Uninterested. Eight. Eminent. Imminent. Nine. Imply. Infer. Ten. Principal. Principal. Okay. Most of them sound kind of the same, don't they? Yeah. So that's why we call it homophones. But they definitely have, uh, most of the time, a different writing and a different meaning. Yeah. Okay, we continue with number three. You're going to read the sentences. Um, use the context to identify the meaning of each boldface word. So, if they're so similar, how would I know what it means then? You would note it by the context in how the word is used. So, context means as all the words and sentences before that boldface word and all the words and sentences that come after the boldface word. All that together is a context. And from following that context, you will know what a word means. And that is also often what we refer to as context analysis. That we're not staring blind at one word or phrase like, oh man, I don't know what that means. But we're going to look at the context and through looking at the context, we can actually already know more or less what that particular word means. Okay, so um, uh, we're going to look at these sentences and we're going to use the context to know what the meaning is of that bold-faced word. And I'd like you to write a letter of the appropriate sentence next to each definition. So how is um, the bold-faced uh, word used and what does that mean? So we have two words and then you would have to write the letter in front of the word. For example, number one, the twin girls both wanted to compete in the world's memory championships, but the judges allowed only one child per family. The parents allowed the teacher to choose which child could compete. They made every effort to remain disinterested. Disinterested. Um, the base word is interested and the prefix is dis. B. The twins had always been uninterested in memorizing boring facts for school exams, but they were very motivated to compete in memory challenges. Uninterested. Now we go and see here that the base word is still interested, but the prefix is un. Now there's a difference between both prefixes, right? Now, you will write down which of these two words uh, is defined by impartial, and the other one, which is that one, would be not curious about. What do you think? Impartial A. Yes, of course. Disinterested means impartial. Yeah, it means that you're not taking sides. You're not subjective, you're objective, you're not taking sides. So you're in between. Neutral. Whereas uninterested means not curious about something. You don't, you're not interested about something. Yeah, cool. Okay, um, I'm going to ask you to uh, pause your video and answer numbers 2 until 10. Okay, go ahead. That brings us to the next part, uh, which is create. Now, what you see here are uh, three beautiful graphs, loving them. The first one is, this one is a line graph, uh, basically. And um, the next one shows uh, a pyramid. And the third one is a bar graph. Look at that one. Very nicely color-coded, which makes it even more 
even easier to recognize the different categories, right? Yeah, so basically this part is about um, expressing or uh, making statements about the graphs that you are seeing. Yeah, you're supposed to work with a partner and then you look at the graphs and then you discuss the graphs, but what you do is you use the sentence starters. So I would like to take a quick look at the sentence starters. Now, these sentence starters use um, the vocabulary that we went through just now. For instance, here with the line graph number for A, it, have, it states, it is astounding that, so we have the word astounding. There's some of the words that we've already had and that come back. Um, the amount of information declines incrementally, probably because C, probably a basic learning principle is, and D, I am assuming, assuming that if the person is uninterested in the information and so on. So what you can see, um, these words are related back to page uh, 17, if you would bear with me uh, real quick, we can see here we had the list of um, 10 paired words, and these are the words that are used uh, in this part of create on page 20. Now, so uh, this is really cool because it's basically uh, now applying uh, the words that we've uh, learned, really putting them into a sentence. Now, you were supposed to do this while discussing and talking to a friend. Um, you can't do that right now, but we will do that in our next Zoom meeting. Um, so what, it, uh, what would be cool is that you just come up with a completion of the sentence. So please just uh, complete each sentence from A, B, C, and D. So for instance, as the example states, it is astounding that we forget information so quickly. Yeah, and so we could just add up to the sentences to make them become complete sentences. It's important for you that you practice this because this will also come back in your test where you have to complete a sentence. So please just complete them by writing them down and through our Zoom meeting of review, uh, some of you can just uh, respond to me asking you how you completed your sentence, okay? There is not one true answer because how you would complete the sentence that would be uh, up to you, but you got to make sure that the bold-faced word makes sense, okay? So those are called sentence starters, and they're all about that particular graph. It's also a good way for you to learn how to read a graph. As in the line graph, we always read from left to right, looking at the horizontal uh, axe. The vertical axe gives mostly us uh, percentages or whatsoever, but the horizontal axe gives us uh, the time. And that can be mentioned in years and days and weeks and in, in time frames. And here it is in minutes. Yeah. Cool beans. Now, in this pyramid, we uh, really look at proportions. These are end results in percentages that are uh, mentioned. And you have the sentence starters A, B, C, D as well. Um, competency, uh, advice, registered and assures me are used. So try to complete these sentences as well. And as we look at the bar graph, uh, in this case, it's also proportions. So uh, we basically look at what the scales are and the end results of every different category. And we have seven different categories, nicely color-coded. And here you have the sentence starters for this bar graph, which includes infer, imply that, uh, pull ourselves into thinking and buy into try to complete those as well. You can pause your video to try to complete the sentences as best as you can. Great, now that has brought us to the next part, which is grammar. Okay, <laughs> grammar. No, not grammar. Grammar, yay, yeah? Okay. Now, this is going to focus on verbs that are followed by gerunds and infinitives. Now, last year, you and I discussed what an, um, a, a gerund is, uh, remembering that that is a verb plus ing, right? And uh, we learned that they can be used as a subject and as, that means at the beginning of the sentence, or an object more into the middle to the end of the sentence. And we also have already talked about infinitives. Uh, which show as purpose. So those are the ones that are um, to 
plus the base form of the verb. So you always have two in the end, the base form of the verb, meaning that an affinity can never be uh, created with ing. Okay? Now, uh, if you look here at the sentences, there are two different ones. Let's look at that. The first one, he stopped recalling important memories after serious concussion on the soccer fields. So this person must have fallen very hard. Stopped recalling. Now, is that a gerund or an affinitive? Are you... Yeah, of course, of course. Smart people. Uh, Stop recalling is gerund because recalling uses ing, and that is def definitely um, a gerund. So the second one, he stopped to recall some of his favorite childhood memories. To recall is the infinitive. Exactly. Now, what you can see here that the, the emphasis actually more lie on the, not on recalling and to recall, but more on the verb that comes before it. Stop. Right? Yeah. Now, uh, we see that the difference is um, the gerund and, as we said just now, the infinity. So, with, in, or without using to. But there are other verbs that we can use to follow a gerund or an infinitive. So, basically, these are verbs that come before any gerund or infinitive. Now, if you look at some of the examples of those, are these. You can, for example, use mean. Mean to go, mean going, or quit. Working, I'm going, uh, work is, quit to work. I'm going to quit working. I'm going to quit to work longer at that place. Regret, going, regret to go, remember doing, remember to do, try saying, try to say. See, these are all verbs um, that can go before a gerund or before an infinitive. Yeah? Okay, cool. Now, some verbs must always be followed by a gerund. Some of them. Yeah, so other verbs must be followed by an, an um, infinitive. Other can be followed by both. It doesn't matter. So that depends a little bit. Now, however, certain verbs that can be followed by either a gerund or an infinitive do have a change in meaning. They sometimes can change the meaning. Sometimes the change is subtle. And sometimes it's very obvious. Now, let's look at the two verbs forget and stop as an example. Forget plus a gerund would be forget, in this case, winning. So he will never forget winning the championship, even through, uh, even though he ended up in the hospital with a traumatic brain injury. So the meaning is to forget an experience. Usually one that's particularly good at that. So forget winning now forget plus infinitive would be after his tbi which was caused by hitting the ball in the soccer match he often forgot to do simple daily tasks to forget to perform an action now we can also use stop plus a gerund he stopped playing soccer after the injury to stop doing something for an extended period of time or you could say to stop with infinitive when he realized how much his head hurt, he stopped to get a medical help, not to stop doing something for a short period of time in order to do something else. So it might sound different using a gerund or an infinitive. Not sound different, mean different. Sometimes the difference is really subtle, you can't really notice, and sometimes very obvious. The point of this grammar part is that you need to remember what a gerund is, for plusing. And what an infinitive is, is two plus the base form of a word, yeah, of a verb. Okay, that you need to remember. Um, and uh, yeah, that there are many verbs that come before a gerund or an infinitive. Okay, remember that one. So some verbs can be followed by a gerund, others an infinitive. They will have uh, a little bit of a change in meaning, but not always so. Now let's try it out. That's the easiest way to understand how this works. Basically, you guys already know uh, the terminology of these two uh, words for today. You're going to read the sentences from the context using the best meaning of the bold-faced verb. Now I want you to write the letter of the appropriate sentence next to the correct definition. Let us try to do number one together, okay? His parents tried to convince him not to play American football since the game was too dangerous and his father had gone through a long recovery from a serious football injury. 
B. Knowing how dangerous football was, he tried playing gentler sports such as ping pong, but the game just wasn't the same. You don't say. Okay. Um, <clears throat> if you look at this, the first one, what is that? Try to convince. To convince. So that one is the infinitive, yes. And then tried playing. So this one, the first one, tried to convince. You see that? This is the infinitive. And then here, tried playing with play plus ing. So this is a gerund, yeah? Okay, experimented with, attempted. So there is a difference between tried to convince and tried playing. If we look at tried to convince, that would be an attempt. So try to convince would mean attempt to do something, trying to do something. <laughs> and tried playing in this case would mean that this person experimented with something. So the first one means an attempt of trying, and the second is experimenting. So these both have a very subtle difference of meaning. Okay, so what I want you to do is I want you to <clears throat> fill out A and B with the correct definition of what these two uh, different meanings are between, for example, number two to the word forget, using it in a gerund and using it in a infinitive. So this is a gerund and this is infinitive. Okay, you can pause your video and answers number two until seven. Good luck. Pronunciation, how we say things, how we express ourselves through words. Exactly, stressing important words. So we're going to focus on what to emphasize on. And when I'm talking about stress, stressing, stressing a word, we're not talking about stress, I'm stressed. We're talking about how we emphasize a word. Um, maybe, tekanan di mana. And that particular stress or emphasis will uh, do a lot in its meaning. Like the sort of meaning that we want to get across, <clears throat> what we want people to get out of what we're saying, um, heavily uh, relies on how we stress it. So this is definitely for keywords. So in this case, important words we're talking about here are keywords. And there are always uh, one or two or even sometimes three or four keywords in a sentence that must be stressed and those keywords carry the main information now in a sentence one or two words usually express the most important information these are the keywords that the speaker wants the listener to notice so there are different ways on how they are stressed example one i've got, got to, to get, get some, some more sleep, sleep. i really, really need, need to, to check, check my, my email, email again so i've got i really so these um, capitalized words are the words that are stressed, <clears throat> yeah? So we stress the most important words by saying them on a high pitch. Maybe we go up with our voice or with a strong stress, like, I really, like, yeah? And the stress vowel is long and loud. We often just also raise our volume. When you speak, make sure your voice is high enough when you stress an important word. Now, in English, we emphasize new information, usually the last important word of the sentence, and we emphasize information that contrasts or corrects. So often we emphasize the word that comes kind of last, which is important, and information that shows a contrast or that corrects something. Let's listen. Example two. Today, we're going to talk about multitasking. The kids are doing email instead of homework. You see clearly how here multi and home are emphasized basically to show a difference, okay? The kids are doing email instead shows contrast, a difference or a correction to home for homework, okay? And here, yeah, they just focus on, want to make sure that it is clear what is the talk, what the talk is going to be about, exactly. Okay, so that brings us to number one. Listen to the sentences, underline the words that are stressed. I'd like you to figure out which ones are those. And some sentences may have more than one stressed word, so some can have two. 
um, maybe even three. And uh, maybe it's good if he tries to uh, pronounce them, so say them out loud. Mohammed. One. Mohammed was listening to hours and hours of lectures on brain plasticity. Two. He was eating lots of brain food every day. Three. Wild salmon was his absolute favorite. Four. He was desperate to change his brain. Patricia. Five. Multitasking was making her crazy. Six. She couldn't concentrate on a single thing for more than five minutes. Seven. Something was totally destroying her brain cells. Eight. She couldn't get rid of her smartphone fast enough. Okay, you might say, Miss Sylvie, that's super fast. Oh my gosh. Okay, I'm going to uh, turn it on one more time. Remember, while you were listening, underline the words that you hear are stressed. Even the maybe the intonation goes up, the, the pitch the, of the voice goes up, um, it becomes louder or it's more uh, pointed out. Okay, ready? Let's go. Mohammed. One. Mohammed was listening to hours and hours of lectures on brain plasticity. Two. He was eating lots of brain food every day. Three. Wild salmon was his absolute favorite. Four. He was desperate to change his brain. Patricia. Five. Multitasking was making her crazy. Six. She couldn't concentrate on a single thing for more than five minutes. Seven. Something was totally destroying her brain cells. Eight. She couldn't get rid of her smartphone fast enough. Awesome. Great. Now, what are we going to do now next is a similar but a little bit different. Um, you're going to read the conversation. Okay, and you're going to to predict, okay, uh, which words will be stressed. And you are going to do that prediction based on the conversation. So try to think of how these people, in what mood they are, how they're talking, how do they say it, how would you say it. And underline the words you think uh, will be stressed or emphasized on. Okay, you can pause your video. Oh, what? Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let you pause your video first, yeah? And you're going to read it by yourself and underline it. And after that, I'm going to turn on the audio and you, you can check whether your prediction was correct. Okay, you can pause the video. Okay, let's hear and see. Check your answers. Exercise 2. Multitasking isn't so bad. Some people are really good at it. Others think they are, but they're just fooling themselves. Agreed, but success at any cost may not be such a good thing. Yeah, that makes me think of my father. He was so hooked on work. When he drove, he was on his cell phone. At red lights, he checked his email. You must be joking. That's multitasking at its best. Well, not exactly. He lost his driver's license after his third accident, which was also his fifth ticket. <laughs> yeah, that's funny. Okay, did you get that one? Cool. Okay, so maybe you saw how your answers were a little bit different from what you heard. But the thing is that we know now that mostly, actually without listening to the audio, you would know, because mostly the keywords in a sentence are emphasized on. Why? Automatically, because those carry the main information. So that's why speakers would emphasize on the most important words in a sentence to make sure that the people who listen will grasp the message. Okay, that brings us to speaking scale, debunking myths and revising misconceptions. Think of it this way. Um, like 20 years ago or 30 years ago, scientists came up with theories and uh, research results and all these hypotheses and so on. And maybe throughout the last 30 or 20 years, things have been revised. They have been 
reevaluated, researched again, uh, and maybe they came up with conclusions that former ideas were not correct or maybe uh, not precise enough. So there must have been in the last, let's say, three decades, adjustments and changes in certain theories or ideas about life. Now, when we are going to go against a former idea or a concept, saying that that is not valid anymore, that it is incorrect for now, then we might debunk it. It means that we go against it, not agreeing with it anymore. Okay? And when we're talking about revising, trying to see, we see like, hey, there's a misconception. Um, what we thought it was is actually not to be. So what we can do is we can change that idea, restate that, re research that again, and um, make it known to people that that was a uh, misconception. Then we are revising things we thought were true. Now, when research actually creates new knowledge, then we have to change our ideas. Because every time a new idea comes up or a new knowledge comes up or a new fact is proven, means that we are resetting uh, our beliefs or our thinking. So that is often called debunking myths or revising misconceptions. It can take a long time for people to learn about and accept the new science. Sometimes people still don't believe it. It takes a long time. We can think about the example of the usage of computers the first time. That was introduced, many people didn't believe in it because the typewriter was good enough. And that took quite long for people to accept, right? And then from handphones to where we are now, every time there will be something new coming up, there will be a change. And we constantly will have to reset ourselves, accepting it and learning to understand it. And then finally learning to use it. Now, Deutsch and Turkel are involved in spreading uh, the new research. We heard that through the audio, and they debunk the older myths, the older ideas, to try create a new understanding with people. Now read and listen to the conversation. Notice how the underlined expressions are used in conversation to correct a myth or misconception. Here we have underlined words such as actually that's not true, um, that brings us here, it turns out or um, sorry but that's no longer an accepted fact and actually that's been proven false let's just listen to it example our brains shut down when we sleep actually that's not true for the longest time we thought our brains shut down when we slept but it turns out our brains never shut down our brains stop developing after we are about seven or eight years old. Sorry, but that's no longer an accepted fact. We used to believe that brain development stopped during childhood, but now we know our brains continue to grow and change throughout our lifespan. We only use 10% of our brains. Actually, that's been proven false. A while ago, people thought we used only 10% of our brains. But now it's widely known that all parts of our brains are continually active. Interesting. Now, you, how, you can see how there is a correction in idea, right? Actually, that's not true. Um, it turns out, sorry, but that's no longer an accepted fact. Now we know. Actually, it has been proven false. So these are all these ways on how to debunk a former belief or understanding and um, how to revise it. Now here you have the list of useful expressions for debunking myths and revising misconceptions. Yeah, actually that's not true. Not all of them. Yeah, nicely placed there. And basically right now it's the part where you are going to try to um, work this one out by using the useful expressions, uh, looking at these sentences. So in this case, in blue, student A has a belief, such as people are either right-brained or left-brained, and then student B would correct a myth. Uh, people use both sides of the brain to perform everyday tasks, but you would have to uh, use the useful expressions here in order to make uh, a correct answer, debunking and revising a myth. Now, 
we're gonna do that in our next zoom meeting so please do read it go over it be prepared because i will ask some of you to do that yay exciting <laughs> okay that brings us to the end of our lesson today uh this part focus on speaking uh, was quite a lot. We started off with um, our vocabulary and from our vocabulary uh, we talked a little bit about what a diagram is, yeah, visual with uh, categories explained and <clears throat> we went into uh, homophones, words that are uh, the same in its pronunciation or sound or very similar but are different in meaning and often also are spelled differently. Yeah, and then we had to figure out what the difference was in meaning for that one. Then we went over three graphs. We had the line graph, the bar graph, and the pyramid. And we were not so much focusing as in how to read those, but we focused more on how we could make statements about it. Uh, we were uh, given a sentence starters with the vocabulary of this unit and then uh, we had to try to complete it with the ideas we got from looking at it so it was not so much on detailed facts but more in how to complete these sentences that were in line with them with the graph then we went over some grammar remember gerund versus infinitive gerund verb plus in infinitive is two plus the base form of the verb and that there are verbs that come before gerunds and infinitives right and how that sometimes uh, there is a slight difference in meaning or a very obvious difference in meaning and uh, we talked about pronunciation so we focus on keywords that keywords are mostly referred to as the important words and most of the time speakers emphasize on those keywords and you know already that there are definitely two or three keywords in a sentence now it is those words that are stressed by either the voice going up or down, or louder or pausing. And the last one was debunking myths and revising misconceptions on how do we revise older ideas and facts which are not valid anymore today and how do we respectfully, properly uh, debunk or revise. Awesome! You did a great job today. I'm very proud of you. And I'll see you again in the next video. God bless you all. Bye! Thank you.